me when someone asked me what do you think is the single biggest problem that you have in Judaism on the uh, application we have uh, you know it's, I think yesterday I answered the question the answer is a simple answer ignorance people simply are ignorant today about what the truth is about God about his Torah about the purpose of your life ignorance is running rampant and that's the biggest problem we have today because if people only knew how beautiful and delicious our Torah is if people only knew how the Torah is an obligation and not a suggestion how the mitzvot are an obligation and not a suggestion how anything that you do that's contrary to the Torah is guaranteed to fail if simple if people simply knew this everyone would do tshuva by 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 the by the millions uh, but unfortunately today we have such high level of ignorance that uh, it's very easy to confuse this generation with uh, mistaken uh, teachings because people that don't know don't know what they don't know and therefore they're easy to confuse them it's easy to uh, mislead them unfortunately today Rabotaya Karim we're in a situation where if you do not do some legwork yourself to double check what you're learning what your wife is learning what your husband is learning what your children are learning it is very very likely that you're learning things that are against the Torah and it's very likely that you're going to be Meshubash Meshubash means someone that's a little bit to have a a little bit of a defect spiritually a little bit of a spiritual defect he goes to shul he prays he puts on tefillin but once in a while he'll smoke a cigarette or look his or look at his phone on Shabbat you know he'll he'll I'll keep Shabbat he'll know all the halachot by heart he has a strimal on everything else but he's in a cash advance business lending money to people in order to kill them practically you know unethical in business or countless other projects uh, other subjects other th- issues other problems Rabotai we're in a situation today where the Ikvita de Meshicha, the era of Mashiach that the Rav Wasserman has been teaching us for the last several months is literally showing itself in front of our eyes happening but it's not the bombs that we're scared of it's not the viruses that we're scared of it's not the terrorists that we're scared of it's not the presidents that we're scared of it's unfortunately the misteachings the misleadings the liars the missionaries both Jewish and non-Jewish those are the ones that we're scared of why because unfortunately you get a lot more bees with honey than you uh, can if you're trying to swap them down and this is what's happening the missionaries the misleaders the uh, the, the Zionists the anti Torah the heretics they're getting millions of people to follow them how with honey they tell people whatever they want to hear in a way they want to hear it in the media they want to hear it in a place they want to hear and what ends up happening since people don't verify things don't double check things you have an entire generation of confused people entire generation of confused people and unfortunately sometimes those confused people are very religious people that learn in a kolel and learn in yeshiva and everything else but perhaps they didn't double check certain things and just assumed certain things were said were right and they ended up living an uh, you know an entire section of their life completely against the Shem without knowing it so the Ikvita the Meshicha the era of Mashiach that Rav Wasserman is telling us is not really spending so much time telling us about the bombs that are going to happen before Mashiach come, ha- comes or the big war of Gog Magog where two-thirds of the world are going to be destroyed like the Prophet uh, uh, Zachariah says in chapter 14 or all of the uh, horrific events and death and annihilations that will happen like it says in Yechezkel, Ezekiel chapter 38 he's not really spending so much time going into that what is he saying he has spent the last several months telling us first and foremost you should know the only reason why we're in this place why we're in this place where things are not going to be good before Mashiach comes there's going to be birth pangs similar to a pregnancy right before the woman gives birth it's an enormous amount of pain and the reality is the only reason we're in such a situation where that's what's going to happen and that's what's happening before Mashiach comes is because of those shepherds and he has mentioned it time and time again uh, I mean I, I, I was just thinking now 
instead of calling this series Era of Mashiach, we should call it the series of wars because every week there's a new war on somebody else that's violating Divrei Chazal, that's violating Divrei Chachamim, that's going against the words of the Chachamim, going against exactly what Rav Wasserman is saying. And by the way, there's another one today. Stay tuned to find out who. Anyone that connects, follows, supports these false prophets will be punished severely. Just like it's written in the Torah. Just like it's promised in the Torah. Now what if I didn't know he was a false prophet? Well, it behooves you to know. You should do some research and verify that he's not a false prophet. Because when you go up to heaven, and the bed deen over there, before they let you into heaven or to gain all, they ask you these questions. Why did you listen to this guy, even though he said things that are clearly against the Torah? Why did you listen to this woman, even though she says and acts with things that are clearly against the Torah? Why did you do it? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, you didn't know? Oh, poor you. Okay, section 7. See you. What? We gave you 70, 80, 90, 100 years to know. And you still didn't figure it out? Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense you couldn't figure it out. Why? As Moshe Rabbeinu tells Amisai, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart to do it. The Torah is easy. It's easy. The honesty of Torah, the truth of Torah is easy. Easy to accept. Falsehood is hard to accept. The problem is that you accepted falsehood. Why? Because it soothes your pain. What pain? The desire you have for sins. When the guy told you, no, no, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good, even though you know that you're not so good according to Hashem. You drive on Shabbat, you eat non-kosher, you cheat on your wife, you cheat on your husband, you cheat on your boss, you cheat on your customers, you cheat, 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 cheat non-stop. But somebody said you're, you're tzaddik because you just wrote him a check for five, ten thousand dollars Ah, yeah, see, somebody knows, somebody can really appreciate me. Somebody appreciates me. You think to yourself, in reality, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Baal Talumot, Baal Talumot knows what's hidden. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows the feelings that are in your heart and the thoughts that are in your head and he's going to show it to you in a movie. He says, while well, you're pretending I don't know, I don't know. Here, on that day, at that time, you knew. Why? Here's a transcript of your thoughts. Here's the vocals of your thoughts. You couldn't even hear your thoughts but I heard your thoughts, and here's how you sound. Here's what your thoughts sound like. You knew you were going against the shin, but you like to sin. You like to sin. That's one type of sinner that's in serious trouble. You know who I feel really bad for? His son, his daughter. Why? Because when the parent doesn't know, when a parent, when a parent doesn't care, he likes to sin too much, he doesn't care what the Torah says. That's one thing. But when the child is brought up into the world, and the child, he doesn't know. Why? Because his parents, since they don't care, they're not going to teach their kids to care. Thereby making their kids even more ignorant than them, even more sinful than them. Hence the reason why we have young, cute, stupid kids that make videos that... You would think this kid got all the gifts that a person can get in the world by Kadosh Baruch Hu only to use it against him. Rudy Rochman, very popular on YouTube and Facebook, cute kid, makes all types of silly videos arguing and debating with anti-Semites, many of the Muslims and other Christians and so on, telling them pretty much everything that the Zionists were trying to do with their newspaper articles. But he's doing it in a nice, friendly way. And no, achi, we should be friends. We, there's no reason for us to hate each other. It's just that we're ignorant of each other's history. We can appreciate each other and live united. <laughs> what world do you live in, Rudy? What world do you live in? Now, you know why I never mentioned this until now? Because until now, I cared less about that message. It has nothing to do with me. You think you're going to bring peace to the world. You think you're going to decrease anti-semitism with these debates you have bechabo and enjoy yourself not my business nor do i care i just think personally you're wasting your talent why are you wasting your talent? because the kadosh who gave you talent give you charisma give you ability to think give you ability to speak these are very valuable talents you can make a lot of good with 
But what did you choose to do? You chose to do something that's going to waste it. But now you know what? That's not the worst thing in the world. You know what's the worst thing in the world? What you did today. What you did today is the only thing that came to my attention because I don't watch your videos. But you're going to listen to this because someone's going to show you this. What you did today was a Chilul Hashem. One of the worst possible things ever happened on the internet happened with your mouth today. Worse than most of the other messages I've talked about. Why? Because you look good as a good Jew, you act good as a decent human being, and thereby you have thousands of people following you as the model Jew, as the nice ethical boy, the cute kid, and they listen to what you say. And you know what you said today in a three-minute video? You said that tefillin is part of a culture. And if you put on tefillin as a Jew, it's good, you connect to your culture. But if you don't, no big deal. Unfortunately today, people try to categorize what it means to be a Jew. We've, in a way, Christianized sections of Judaism as if we were Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, which comes straight from the church. There's no such thing as Orthodox, Conservative, Reform. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. We're part of a family, and each Jew has their own way of practicing based on the way that they grew up, based on their conclusions, based on the point in their life. Someone who puts on tefillin or doesn't put on tefillin, it doesn't make a difference on if they're more or less Jewish. It's just the way that they connect to their culture. And every single Jew connects to their culture in a different way, and also that evolves what worked for them 10 years ago may not work for them the same way today or in 10 years. So some people just put tefillin because they're told that they have to and that doesn't really do anything for you. What you need to do is when you put tefillin have an intention, have a reason, understand why and use this ancient practice, the sacred practices that we've been transmitting and passing down for thousands of years for a positive reason and in a positive way. This is very important for our generation to understand that it's not just about putting on tefillin, it's what it represents and how you can use it in order to make yourself a better person. Moody, you may be familiar with a little bit of what happened in the foundation of modern day Israel, most likely not enough because I don't think you've ever mentioned the truth about real Zionists. You should watch some of our shulim. But what you said about the Torah is an abomination. Why? Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Page 17a, open it, see what it says. It says there are certain people that get punished for going against the Shem for a year. But there are certain people that go against the Shem with their body and thereby their punishment is eternal Gehenom. You want to know what Gehenom is? Watch my lecture about Gehenom, Shur number 84. Type in Gehenom on my YouTube page or my app. You'll see what Gehenom means for three and a half hours of one lecture and another few hours with a few other ones. Point being is, the Gemara, our sages say someone that sins, certain sins, can get punishment for a year. But it's a unique type of sinner that sins with their body, permanent punishment. Meaning, that neshama goes to hell forever until it's completely annihilated. Maybe after a million years or whatever time is in a place where there's no time. So the Gemara says, wow, that's a pretty severe punishment. Who are these sinners? Give us some examples. Give us some examples of someone who sins with their body. Now, if you fast forward to the Rashid Chokhmah Masechet Genom, it's going to talk about wasting seed, that's sinning with the body, uh, being with a married woman, that's not your married woman, that's sinning with the body, and so on. But the Gemara gives a smaller example that's bigger. It's smaller because most of us don't even think it's a sin. It's bigger because once you realize how big of a sin is, you realize what you just did today. You know what the Gemara says? The Gemara says that a Jew that does not put on tefillin goes to Gainom forever until his neshama is destroyed. He has no share of the world to come. For a sin that a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself says a person goes to Gehenom forever, you say it's a custom. And if you want to do it, you can do it. And if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Rudy, stick to politics. Stay away from religion until you learn a little bit. Because you influence a lot of people that watch this stupid video of yours. And guess what? They may never watch another religious video for a long amount of time, maybe even ever. And they're going to rely on you when they go up to the Bet Din of Shammai. And they're going to ask them, Hey, uh, Steve. Hey, uh, Yaakov. You are a modern Orthodox Jew from the UK. How come you didn't put on tefillin? What do you mean? My rabbi said it's not a big deal. 
Who's your rabbi? It's Rudy. Rudy's my rabbi. The pro-Zionist, the pro-Israel, pro-peace, pro-everything good, cute kid, bad, non-kosher haircut. That one? Yeah, he told me he's my rabbi. He told me it's no big deal to not put on tefillin. If you want to do it, you can do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. You know, it's a custom. It's a custom. Even he himself says sometimes yes, sometimes no. And who knows? Because even a sidu is something that you get from a giveaway. If you're going to speak about things you know about, speak. But don't go into the Torah and start distorting it according to your likings. You know why? Because the only thing that makes you a Jew is the very same Torah that you distorted, just like the fake prophets. What are we celebrating in a few days? We're celebrating Hanukkah. Why are we selling Hanukkah? Is it because of the Sufganiyot? Because we all want to get fatter like me? Why are we celebrating it? Because of Zionism? Why are we celebrating Hanukkah? We're celebrating Hanukkah because a few Chalidim, five Chalidim, five religious Jews went AWOL, went crazy on all of the secular Zionists of the day, the Giborim, the Mitzvahim, all the people that were anti-Torah, including the Jewish people, not just the non-Jewish people. They went against them. All five of them beat an entire army of anti-Torah personalities. In reality, Hanukkah is a celebration of the Torah. But why would they do it? Because the Torah is the only thing that makes a person Jewish or not Jewish. Not your mother. Your mother makes you qualify to be a Jew. Following the Torah is what makes you a Jew. Why? Because at Mount Sinai, a second before we got the Torah, there was no Judaism. Judaism wasn't born. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were not Jewish. They were Israelites. They were Noahites. Judaism was only born at Mount Sinai when we got the Torah. The first time the Torah mentions the word Jew is in Megillat Esther, a thousand years later. But the point is, when we got the Torah at Mount Sinai, that's when Judaism was born. Hence, we understand that to be a Jew, you have to obey the Torah. Not because who your mother is. Why? Because the same day that all of Am Yisrael became Jew, all the Israelites became Jewish, so did Yitro. So did Yitro. Yitro wasn't an Israelite. In fact, he was an idol worshiper in the past, the Pope of that day. But he became a Jew. Why? He accepted the Torah. You fast forward to all of the generations, all of those Jews that followed Moshe Rabbeinu and survived and prospered and had kids. Guess what? They had to survive. Survive against all of the anti-Torah people. Survive against all of the people that want to destroy the Torah more than anything else in the world. And the only thing that kept all of them Jewish was the Torah, not their mother. The Torah did. Why? Because if any generation had a child that didn't follow the Torah and intermarried with a non-Jew, guess what? He stops being Jewish. His kids stop being Jewish and so on. Why? Because the Torah says so. He himself, if he does tshuva, if his mom is a Jew, he's a Jew. But if he dies that way, if he dies in Timad, if he dies in Mechalel Shabbat, guess what? He's out of luck. He goes to Gehenom, he gets destroyed. That's what the Torah says, not me. The reality is, when you go into the Torah world and you start speaking nonsense and call it a culture, you are insulting Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Meir Bar all of the sages, all of the Rabbanim, all of the Gdolei Adol, all of the basic level Abrahim and the little kids that are in a cheder just to stay Jewish. You want to talk about Zionism? You want to talk about Israel? You want to be peaceful with the Arabs? Go be best friends with them for all I care. But don't start talking about the Torah like you know what you're talking about. Calling it a custom. Because if it was a custom, you wouldn't be here. The reality is, Rabbi this same message has to be delivered that way. A nice way is not going to get the message across because that's what happens. In the world that we live in today, people don't get the message in a nice way. The klipa we all have, we all have on ourselves from our many sins and our many mistakes gives us, unfortunately, a huge shell that blocks us from what the truth is. Our ego blocks it. Our, our, our reputation blocks it. Everything blocks it. So sometimes you have to speak in such a way where you know what? It hurts. But if it's true, I guess maybe I can fix myself. You see, Rudy, 
You are not the only one. There are plenty of other people like you. You may actually have hope much more than others because it looks like you're a decent kid, but you were probably born to parents that don't know very much. And you are the product of the previous generation that didn't care so much. You can change, but you have to fix that video. You have to fix a lot of videos. I haven't watched your videos. And if I do and I see others, I'll call them out too. All I'm telling you is if you care about Amisel as much as you say you do, start observing the Torah like you're supposed to. Don't talk to me about Eretz Yisrael. We have no right to the land unless we follow the Torah. That's the only right that we have. The only one that gave us a right to that land is Akadosh Baruch Hu. But Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us that right in the Torah, the very same Torah that does not call it to fill in a custom. In fact, it calls it a covenant. What's a covenant? A deal. What's a deal? A deal is if you keep it good, you'll get a lot of good stuff. You don't, no more deal. That's what a covenant is. We have Brit Milah is a covenant. Shabbat is a covenant. Tefillin is a covenant. That's why the word Shabbat, Shin, Bet, Taf, is an acronym. Shin for Shabbat. Bet for the Brit. Taf for Tefillin. A Jew has to be observing at least two of those covenants every day. So Monday through, through Friday, or Sunday through, uh, through Friday, those are the secular days. We don't keep Shabbat, but we have two other Brits. We observe our Brit and we observe our Tefillin. Observing our Brit is not the Brit that you had when you were eight days old and no one even asked you your opinion. Observing our Brit is not wasting seed, not being promiscuous, and not doing things that are against the Shem, homosexuality and the likes. That's keeping your Brit. You do that, you put on Tefillin, you're observing the covenant with Hashem. On Shabbat, you don't put on Tefillin. Why? Chachamim said that Tefillin is Muktzeh on Shabbat. So what do you do to observe two, two, two Brits? You have Shabbat and you have the Brit Milah. You see, the last thing that the Tefillin is, is a custom. The last thing it is. Why? It's a deal. It's either a deal or a deal breaker. To call it to all of your audience, which Hashem only knows how many people are going to watch that god-awful video that you made, why you're not more Jewish, the amount of damage that it can cause is something that you perhaps can't even fix in a lifetime. And I promise you, the more you learn Torah, the more you realize the last thing we need is to care about what the anti-Semites think of us, what the Arabs think of us, what the, the, the Christians think of us. The last thing we need is that. The first thing we need is our Torah. Because our Torah is what makes us Jewish. That's what makes us Jewish. Not the custom. The shawarma that you eat and the, uh, the little baklava that you eat and the little bit of shakshuka that you eat and some salad with hummus, that you, all that stuff, that's customs. That's customs. But guess what? Arabs eat that stuff too. That doesn't make them Jewish. That doesn't make them Jewish. Covering your hair, that doesn't make you Jewish. Why do Arabs do that too? Putting pants on and shirts on doesn't make you Jewish. Why many people in mankind have that too? What makes you Jewish is the Torah. But not just that your grandfather from 3,000 years ago got it. But rather that you got it. That you're observing it completely. Even if that means that you have to go against everything you've ever said until this point. That's what makes us Jewish. For 3,330 years, Am Yisrael has been fighting tooth and nail against irreligious ideas like this. Calling the Torah customs, calling the rules customs, calling the sages something that's optional for you to listen to or not. Who does this? People that never actually studied or were addicted to their desires to the point where it didn't matter if they studied or not. If a person says that he loves Am Yisrael and he loves being a Jew, he has to act accordingly. The guy that's going to tell his patients, hey, listen, everything's okay, while knowing that the patient's going to die, that's not a good doctor. That's a murderer. A good doctor is going to tell his patient, hey, I'm sorry to tell you, 
you have a horrible disease and you maybe have a short period of time to live yeah the guy may start crying and the girl may start crying and everybody start crying but at least they know what they're dealing with the doctor that tells him no everything's okay everything's okay and the guy goes home and he dies that's not a good doctor that's a murderer but what does the murderer think of himself he thinks he's a doctor he thinks not only he's a doctor he thinks he's a good doctor and that's why the Gemara in Masechet Kiddushi says that a tov shebarofim a tov shebarofim olech legeinum the best of doctors goes to geinum why would the best of doctors go to geinum why would the best of doctors just help people no no the best of doctors meaning he thinks he's so good he doesn't want to tell people the truth and break their hearts so he figures you know what if I tell this guy he's gonna die that's gonna make him upset at me as if I did it it's gonna make him upset altogether you know what let me be a good doctor and just tell him everything's okay the Gemara says that's not okay that's murder because had you told him the truth at least you would have known what he's dealing with even though it's painful you rather deal with the honest pain than a tr- than a lie that seems painless but ends up being critical we live in a generation where there's false prophecy everywhere that false prophecy is not one of the things that was invented by Rudy or by some of the other people that we've spoken about that false prophecy has been something that unfortunately has been running rampant since the beginning it's our responsibility to discover the truth and glue ourselves to it no one else is responsible for that we have to take charge we have to learn we have to comply we have to do now surely you need some help you need some teachers you need some guides and so on and so forth and you need to find who's the truthful one who's not the way to identify who's truthful and who's not is based on the sources they give you if their source is constantly themselves and their own ideas very very high likelihood that that person is a false prophet if the person gives you sources and it agrees with traditional Judaism authentic Judaism you may have a good chance of actually finding a good one now if a person goes to a good rabbi a good prophet if you will they'll be blessed to learn the right thing they go to a good rabbit sin learn the good things Baruch Hashem, they'll be blessed what about if we go to a bad one aside from the fact that we're going to be misled what is Hashem going to consider us when someone is a fake prophet when someone is a fake speaker when someone does not have an intention or care or even a strategy of how to help Am Yisrael do tshuva but yet they choose to speak in front of an audience a Jewish audience nonetheless HaKadosh Baruch Hu says such a person is a Navi Sheikh it's a fake prophet that's going to be persecuted in Shemaim for mistreating the gift that Hashem gave him Hashem gave him a stage with 500 people a thousand people 2,000 people every week every day 50 100 a million people every week on different media and instead of using that stage that Hashem gave you as a gift you are using your beauty to become a harlot like the prophet was saying earlier today Hashem will punish that speaker said for Hasidim from 800 years ago speaks very harshly about false speakers people that do not rebuke the public and tell them to do tshuva but what about the people themselves the listeners the listeners of that false speaker not even the ones that support them and give money the ones that simply listen the one that simply listened Rabbi Taya Karim are called people that eat at Izebel's table that's what they're called they eat the false prophecy now anyone that's a false prophet and was wondering what happens to false prophets will finish with this last point the Rambam writes in Ilchot Shuvah chapter 4 there are 24 deeds which hold back tshuva meaning that the punishment that Hashem gives to a person in this world is making tshuva nearly impossible for such a person what kind of sins earn a person such a punishment which the Rambam calls 
perhaps the worst punishment there is. Uh, one before the last one. Because one, one, one particular sin is Hashem removes the ability of tshuva. In this case is that it holds it back, meaning it makes it very difficult. 24 specific sins that hold back tshuva. Four are commissions of severe sins. God will not grant a person who commits such a deed to do tshuva, to repent at all, because of the gravity of his transgression. Meaning the, the, the sin is so big, Hashem says there's going to be so much damage as a result of your video, of your act, of your bad speeches. So many people are going to go to Ganem for it. It's simply not right to put you in heaven. Unless you fix yourself, which is almost impossible in many cases, especially for people like Manus Friedman and other people that we've spoken about that have literally millions and millions of views of falsehood. It's virtually impossible to fix such a thing. Not only you would have to erase it, you would have to undo it in every speech in hopes that you reach every single person you've reached in the past and listen to it. But the point being is that who who did it? Who's the ones that gets such a punishment? The first one, one who causes the masses to sin. One who causes the masses to sin, Rabotai Krim, the Rambam, Paskins Lalecha, which means that in Shemaim, that's what the Psak is. Someone that causes the public to sin, Hashem takes away their natural ability to do tshuva and makes it very difficult. Why? They're constantly going to have false prophets tell them, no, you're okay, everything's okay, you're perfect as you are, Hashem loves you as you are, look at how much good you do, look at how you donated, look at how life is going great for you. Everyone thinks that, you know, because everything looks great today, therefore it's great. One of the best things that I think I've ever seen in my life to get a real perspective of how things really work in this world Aside from my own personal life and my own personal journey from being here to being here in Baruch Hashem, we're better than ever today, but nonetheless, everyone that knows my personal story knows what kind of beautiful journey we've been on. At least the one that I tell you about. But one of the best things, aside from that, one of the best Musar lessons I ever saw in my life was seeing a short video about bodybuilders after they retired. Now this may sound odd to some of you. I don't necessarily recommend for anybody to watch this. But to me, it was a Musa lesson. Why? As a young kid, I used to lift weights. I was very strong. And, you know, when you're young, you're 17, 18 years old, you can lift a half a house on your head. You figure, oh, I'm always going to be this way. And even if I can't lift 800 pounds anymore, I'll be able to play with 200, 300 always. Never in your wildest dreams do you think things will change so much. When I saw this video, I saw these people that were gladiators, or at least they looked like. They had muscles that were the size of people. The muscle was the size of another person. Each person was 300, 350 pounds of solid muscle. Every little part of their body was carved like it was a drawing. And they were on shows, which is, again, not recommended to watch. It's not modest. It's not good. But what's actually good, what was good for me at that point, was to see what happened to them after they retired, after they stopped juicing and stopped with all the garbage that they put into their body that made them look like everything was good. Disaster. Most of these people look worse than someone that never worked out a day in their life. In fact, some of them have become disabled. Some of them died. Some of them lost their mind. Same thing happened with some people that I know from the past that were athletes. As soon as their three, four, five year career of making millions of dollars was over, literally their life turned for the worse. Now, why do I tell you this? Because while they were all winning, while we were all winning, while we were all printing money, all building muscles, we all looked good. We all looked like we were running the world. We all looked like everything was going for us, like it was never going to end. You were always going to win. You were always going to look good. You were always going to feel good. No one in their right mind ever saw themselves 10, 15, 20 years out looking like this old man, missing teeth, crippled, can't move, barely wants to live, needless to say, barely alive. No one ever saw themselves. Why? It looked like you were winning. You got 100 million views and everyone liked you today. Akadosh Baruch Hu says this. All of the looks is the Satan 
tempting you to continue in this wrong way. Why? It looks good today. The Torah says, forget about what looks good today. That's temporary. It's temporary. A week, a year, a couple of years, 10 years, 50 years even, let's say. Temporary. If you don't change your way, You'll be in such a bad scenario, you're going to wish you were one of those retired bodybuilders that looks worse than everybody else. You see it all the time. This world is temporary. Whatever possessions you have in this world, however much or however little, temporary. The only thing that's permanent is the Torah that you fulfill. The Torah that you know and the Torah that you fulfill. That's the only thing that's permanent. You fulfill the Torah by learning it, Chazaku Baruch. You fulfill the Torah by giving Tzedakah, Chazaku Baruch. You fulfill the Torah by continuously teaching and, and, and acquiring as much knowledge as possible, Chazaku Baruch. But if you ignore it, if you desecrate it, if you simply don't care for it, that is not Baruch. It's Chazak, but it's not Baruch. But it's Chazak in a bad way. It's Chazak, it's strong in a bad way. It's a strong punishment that the person is bringing themselves. And that punishment is not just in the eternal world. It also starts here. And that's what I saw in that video. I saw that those people, they looked literally like statues at some point in their life. No one in their right mind ever thought that that's going to be over. They looked so perfect, you never thought it's even possible for that person to look like a regular person. Only to find out that literally within a few years, less than a handful of years, Many of them deteriorated to a point where if you looked at them, you think they're sick. You think that there's something wrong with them. And for sure, if they show you their bodybuilding picture, you don't believe it's them. It's like, oh, yeah, it's probably your brother. Yeah, it's probably your cousin. It's not you. There's no way that that and you is the same thing. Just like when you look at some athlete's bank account. Before he started, he had nothing. After he made a hundred million dollars, wow, can't believe you went from that. Great for you. But then four or five years after retirement, he's worse than what he was before he started. You're like, wait, you went from a hundred million dollars to negative 20 million and you're pretty much never going to make money again? How is that even possible? Even if you do it on purpose. Akadosh Baruch works in extraordinary ways. And a person that does not acknowledge that in their life will suffer so much in this life it's simply not worth living. Please, don't insult the Torah. Don't ignore the Torah. Look into it. Learn it. Acknowledge it. Most importantly, follow it. The best thing that can happen out of that, you end up going to Gan Eden. The worst thing, you end up going to Gan Eden. Amen, amen.